good morning, everybody. I think we are ready to get started. I'm Ella Nikolai, I'm the chairman of the English Speaking Union in Romania, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the finals of the 22nd National Public Speaking Competition in English. As always, and as usual, I'm sure everybody is very excited to get to the speeches, so I'm not going to be very long. But before we get started, there are just a few things that I'd like to say. I would first of all like to thank the Jockey Club for once again hosting us. This is the third year that we're organizing the finals here, and we're very happy that we can do this here. Uh, also, there are some sponsors that I would like to thank for helping us and for supporting the competition. And that is uh, Oxford Nicolescu for providing the prices. Also, Uniscan, Hecate, Fisher International, and Lamster Trading. And also, uh, Borsec for keeping us hydrated yesterday and today as well. So many thanks to them. Also, I would like to thank our esteemed adjudicators for taking the time and being here with us today. And we have uh, Kendall Peet, which is the head of school for the International British School of Bucharest. <laughs> we have Mr. Shane Egan from the British Council Romania. And we have Ms. Maria Bujan, who is the inspector for English from the Romanian Ministry of Education. I'd like to thank Mr. Robert Bondoroi, who is our chairperson for today, for graciously, <laughs> for graciously accepting once again to be our uh, chair for today. We also have a timekeeper. As you probably already know, by this uh, stage, you will be getting uh, three signals during your speech. One at four minutes and 30 seconds. There will be a knock on the table and a raise of hand. You will get one at five minutes, and at five minutes and 30 seconds, you will be stopped, okay? After the, your speech has finished, there will be questions from the audience and the <coughs> members of the adjudication panel. There will be approximately three minutes for <coughs> questions. Please keep in mind that there will be one question per participant, and we are not turning it into a debate, so make sure you think about the question that you're asking and um, hopefully the answer you receive is satisfying but there's just one question per person yeah so keep that uh, keep that in mind uh, also if there are no questions from the audience you will be getting a question from the uh, adjudication panel and if there are uh, no further questions i think i will uh, give the floor to mr bondoro and we can start the competition <coughs> Thank you. Uh, welcome. Yes, we we'll start. Uh, we'll start the competition. I will ask uh, the people who, po who are posing the questions to remain standing while you're being, uh, you're receiving your answer. Okay, don't uh, sit down. And uh, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, one person can, can only ask one question. Yeah, I will be selecting the uh, the, the, the the people who are asking the questions. And uh, I hope that you're not going to be, going to be too shy. Yeah? It's one in a lifetime opportunity for some. Yeah? So let's start. The first uh, speaker is Boton Siladi with his speech, Steel in the Walls. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Integrity, steadfast adherence to strict moral or ethical code. Forgive my impression of a pocket dictionary, but I deemed it worthy of display not so much for comedic purposes, but because it does help me communicate something quite relevant. This is the only way I can agree to the topic of this year's competition. It is not rules that integrity needs. Integrity needs principle. After a little thought experiment, I will talk about three houses in my speech. But let's start with a thought experiment, which will hopefully serve to clarify what I mean by either void or steel inside the walls. Imagine two buildings in poor condition. One building gets fixed from the outside. They put some scaffolding around it, some wires that prevent it from collapsing. The other building is fixed another way. The workers come and put steel in the walls and pillars inside the house. 
this is, to an admittedly simple take on architecture, the difference between rules and principle. Rules try to mend things from outside. For instance, I don't care if you want to eat fruit, but you mustn't eat it. Principle is something that is on the inside. I will not eat fruit, but even if I really want to. The first building might not collapse tomorrow or the day after that, but eventually it will, for its walls are hollow. And the weather is cold outside. Day in and day out, we find that not only are people seeking to harm those they do not even know because of their thirst for an order based on fear, but also that those who should be giving us a helping hand use their reach to scratch a friend's back. The first house I will talk about is the state. Is it not angering, I ask, that in the parliament, where people of principle should be striving to make things better for the citizens, we find hollow walls? Is it not angering that in the people's palace, the name of which seems more and more sarcastic, the norm instead of being integrity and goodwill is corruption and deceit? We have politics for politicians. And this old house with hollow walls is creaking. These following passages may be familiar to some of you. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. I think Dylan Thomas's verses serve to encourage us to fight for a better future. Each of us in our own ways that we choose. Let us stand up to the corrupt and shame them with acts of bravery, compassion, and perseverance when fighting them. But if our fragile shelter of the state weren't enough, we have deluded mass murderers who will slay those who will depend in a way of which they do not approve. This world we live in, this second house, is turning into a haunted house, haunted by the bitter and cruel realities of our days. And it is horrifying to think that what we had seen in Paris not long ago this year in Jakarta and just almost two weeks ago in Brussels is only a tiny corner of the hell that some people live in. We should rage against the dying of the light. But how? I turn to Tolkien's character, Gandalf the Grey, for some advice, who says, I found it is the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. It might seem too small a gesture to post with the hashtag, we are not afraid, as the people of Indonesia did at the times of the attacks on Jakarta. But as long as these flickers of light live, we still have hope for a better future. For even a candle in a window is bright enough to let others know that the house is not abandoned. And only through our integrity, only through our principles, can we fight the tragic wars which we must fight. The last and most difficult fight is the fight against ourselves. The easiest person to fool is yourself. And you are your biggest enemy. We often say with radiant optimism that there is anarchy in Darth Vader. Seldom do we realize that the opposite is true as well. And in moments of weakness, we often prove to be dangerous people to share a roof with, to share the roof of this third house that is our mind. On many fronts we are battered, with relentless assault, but we must endure. Our struggle should only be eased by the fact that we are in these battles, against the corrupt, against frenzied brutes, and against ourselves, brothers in arms. I want to know how to lead a good life, as I imagine is the case with the members of this audience. How can I be a good person, a person of integrity? I want to live a good life and deserve a good death. What needs to be done? The answer is to a very simple take on architecture. Have steel in the walls. Questions, please. Okay. As a speaker, say you're a member of the parliament and you actually try your best 
to serve the people. However, a large majority of the parliament does not respect that and is corrupt. How do you think people will treat you and how do you think, uh, what do you think you should do in order for people to realize that you're actually an honest person? It's a great question. I'm reminded of the example of uh, presidential hopeful, and I hope he will become president, Bernie Sanders, who has been a man of integrity, a man of principle in the parliament, a senator voting on principle in times that it was dangerous to do so. He voted against the Iraq war, for example. He always presented the pre, uh, represented the people. Excuse me. And uh, his example resonates um, around uh, young people. The people will flock to those um, who are ready to lead them on principle and to serve them truly. Thank you. Questions, please. Okay, so you talk about a house um, standing because it, it has steel within its walls. Um, what creates that structure? What creates the steel? Where does the steel come from within society? Because right now it seems to be failing. The quality of the metal seems to be failing. Thank you very much for your question. I think that principles come from education. Uh, there is a minor work of Kant on education, in which he says, man is an animal who needs a master. And this master can be anything. Um, I think that uh, he meant uh, morals, he meant principle. The pri uh, principle comes from our parents, our ancestors. We have to look into our history, see our faults, and uh, see our uh, good deeds, and uh, judge our own character upon that. We have to evolve continuously, and the way to do that is to learn, to love art, to love the sciences, and to get as much information in as possible. Based on that, we can find out where we stand in the world. I think the, the biggest problem um, you recognize is that uh, people don't, uh, uh, don't educate themselves anymore. They go to school and then uh, do a university and we are very uh, uh, narrow-minded. I think we should educate on, uh, ourselves on a general level and that is uh, a guarantee for having good principles. Florina Adrian, a high impact choice. An Indian history critic once said, history tends to repeat itself. Although this might have been a rather hasty statement, by analyzing the deeds of our ancestors, we realize that many of them were similar. Therefore, even if it may sound ridiculous or unrealistic, the critic's remark seems to be legitimate. Having this in mind, I want to point out details about the matter I would like to present, the vote of the next president, which makes no exception to this rule. People are confronted with choices every time. For instance, in the morning, when you have to choose between a cup of coffee and a cup of tea, or when you go to school, you take either the bus or a taxi. These are, however, minor choices which have an insignificant impact on our day-by-day -day lives. The choice of the next president is actually much more important and has to be treated as such. Everyone who has the right to vote should take this matter very seriously because, after all, the president is, in the majority of countries, the most powerful person. They should leave aside their affinity towards a certain political party and choose their favorite candidate by going through his or her achievements up until that moment in order to have a clear view of the candidate's competence. Unfortunately, very many people do not take this as seriously as they should and vote someone just because their appearance seems to be nicer than the others or just because he or she is a member of their favorite political party. As I have said before, this matter is no exception to the history tends to repeat itself rule. I would like societies from all around the world have been dealing with this problem for decades. I would like to present one suitable example, which exposes the risks of not carefully analyzing how the outcome would be like if a certain candidate was chosen. 
It is 1934, Germany. Adolf Hitler is named Chief of State, therefore becoming the President and Chancellor of the Reich simultaneously. This action proved to be dreadful for the Germans. After losing the First World War, not only did Germany enter a deep economic crisis, but also the population's morale was extremely low. Taking advantage of this low confidence in the government, Hitler could easily manipulate their minds, deceive them so that they would vouch for him. He promised them wealth, stability, and security, goals that people search for every day, right? Well, an interesting aspect of this matter is Hitler's political background at that time. Before entering the NSDAP in 1920, he had done nothing noticeable. Even after in, uh, entering the party, he was only concentrated on getting more and more power and was even sent to jail in 1924. So why did the people choose him as the leader? Well, there are more reasons, such as the bad administration of the previous governments, the loss of the war, and the desire to change the system. A sense of nationalism emerged gradually until the Nazi party took over the whole political scene. In the end, the Germans' hopes of a better life were shattered in the Second World War. Hitler didn't bring them any kind of better life standards. He brought them only sorrow and despair. This was an example of what may happen if we do not use our own sense of integrity. History has taught us it is wrong to follow someone blindly, like the Germans did with Hitler. People have to be more careful in the choices they make, because these shape our societies. This summer in the USA, people have to vote their new president. Just imagine what would happen if an unsuited person is named chief of state. That would have dramatic effects on all humanity. Now, I would like to finish my speech by asking you a question. You do not have to tell me your answer, just think about it. Which one of these two options is better? To be careful and making choices so that you know the consequences will be right? Or to be careless and make wrong choices that will probably harm not only yourself, but also the ones around you and the society you live in? Thank you for your attention. Questions, please. Do you really believe uh, the president of the country is really chosen by uh, the people of the country? Because there are some uh, rumors telling whether or not uh, the president is really chosen by the people or by the real rulers, uh, which is, uh, are ruling the world from above. And the campaigns, presidential campaigns, are just an excuse for money laundering. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, well, today we are living in a very corrupt world. There are very many societies who do not actually take into consideration the people's thoughts and beliefs. But in my opinion, the people actually vote their president. Especially in our country, I do not think that corruption and the people who are corrupt choose their president, the ones above with who have power. I really think that the people have the majority, the, the major power in this aspect. Thank you. You did uh, mention Adolf Hitler, and yes, he did indeed bring Germany's downfall, but was he not following his own morals when he uh, led the people to doing what he thought was best? Okay, thank you for your question. It's a pretty interesting question, and I'm going to answer it as briefly as possible for everyone to understand. I actually think that he followed his own principles. Well, he wanted to lead his kin further. He wanted the Germans to be more powerful. He wanted to upgrade the technology of that country. But I think he overdid it. In his way of uh, making the life standards better in his country, he actually destroyed the ones around him, the French, the English, and I think that's not a moral thing to do. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
One more question, please. Thank you. How, how do you think that DIPs and real speed would apply in um, a kingdom, say the United Kingdom or such a country, where they don't really choose their president, they have a monarch? Could you please repeat the question loud? Yes, of course. So how do you think the principles and the ideas that you presented in your speech apply to a kingdom, such as the, king, the United Kingdom, where oh. they have a monarch, not a president? Well, I really think that any kind of state, with any kind of country who is a monarchy can actually be changed in a bit and become a republic. Because if the people really want to change the system, they will. After all, the people make the country, not the country makes the people. So actually, I think that my, and the beliefs that I have presented you in my speech actually apply very well on the monarchy itself too, because after all, the people can actually make the system change in a bit. Guy Kapaul, honesty, not fair. Integrity. What does this smart, pretentious word even mean? I mean, yes, we've all heard it, and yes, it's always been in our vocabularies. But how many of us do truly understand the whole meaning of integrity? You see, I ask myself this question when being faced with the task of making an entire speech on the matter. And instead of looking for some strange and boring definitions on the internet, I thought the best idea would be to try and find some suitable examples that would maybe clarify to me what this word meant. The first situation that came to my mind was this plain and simple one. It's late in the evening, you're walking alone, and you stumble upon a wallet lying in the street. You pick it up, maybe you take a look inside, and then you're being faced with a very hard decision to make. Keep it for yourself, or return it. You see, there's no police officer next to you to tell you, I'm going to put you in jail for your entire life if you don't return the wallet. No, it's just you. You and your consciousness. It's like in the cartoons when a little uh, angel and a little devil appear floating around the main character's head, and each of them tries to convince the character to do what each of them wants. Now, Probably, in this case, the angel will tell you that it's uh, good and moral and ethical to go to the nearest police station and return the wallet. On the other hand, his evil counterpart will just say that it's just 10 pounds and there's a bar which it drinks right around the corner. You can have fun tonight for free. Now, in this case, integrity is, I think, the power to understand and follow what the angel says even though the other option might seem a bit more tempting. Tommy Dungy once described integrity as the choice between what's convenient and what's right. Now, let's be honest, of course it would be more convenient to do what your selfish side says. You wouldn't have to bother with going to a police station and signing all kinds of documents, and you would also get to spend your night out for free. But then, you sit for a moment and think, would you feel okay doing that? Would you feel good if you were in the position of the wallet's owner? No. And these questions, these would I feel okay if questions, are the questions that a person with integrity asks themselves when there's no one else to ask. Another problem that came to my mind was, how do we get integrity? Are we born with it? Or do we acquire it as we grow older and develop as persons? The answer is simple. Just take the example from before and add a little twist. It's the five-year-old you walking on the street with your parents. Now, let's say that your father sees the wallet, picks it up and puts it in his pocket and walks away as if nothing had happened. Would you notice, would you notice anything? Probably not. Would you know to do the right thing when your time comes? Definitely not. Now, let's say that your father picks up the wallet and shows it to you and tells you that someone had lost it and it needs to be returned. In this case, his behavior 
would be somehow instilled into yours and would build up to the strength of your integrity so that when you find the wallet, you would be able to make the right decision without needing his guidance or without needing any constraints from any rules. Integrity is, therefore, in no need of regulations. It consists of you having the power to do what's right, even though this decision might lead to a more challenging path. And all this while being told nothing by anyone around you. It means that you have your own consciousness, your own common sense, and that you can make this decision, taking into consideration all the things that will follow and still doing what's right because you know that you have to do so. This is what a person with integrity does. You do follow rules, but only rules set, dictated, and understood by your own consciousness. Thank you. Questions, please. Uh, what if you're faced with a moral dilemma, such as uh, two scenarios, both of which seem wrong? How do you decide which is true, which is the better choice? For example, if somebody says, kill this dog or I will kill ten dogs, how do you make the moral decision then? Well, you just have to think it through. You just have to uh, take into consideration everything that will follow. So, just, and just be as objective as you can about it. Now, in this particular case with the, with the dogs, you kill one dog, okay, it might not seem really nice to you, but then if you don't do that, someone else would kill other 10 dogs, and it's far uh, worse. So you just have to make a decision considering not what's best for you, but what's best in an objective way. Thank you. Thank you. Jakob Istvan, Valuable Clichés. Good day. I would like to start off with a philosophical question. Do you like my suit? Okay, don't have to answer. All I wanted to illustrate is that the first thing that catches our attention is the packing. But don't fool yourself. Go forward and look through what you see. It is ridiculous that many of us don't do that. I read in an article that many youngsters post well-sounding quotes taken from online nonsense code generators even if they are of no value. But do we really prefer a small, sounding, trashy idea to an evergreen truth because we think that the latter is a cliché? Well, let me show you that some clichés should really be considered. So let me ask you some questions. What was the first thing you learned from your mother? What did you feel in the first case when being in her arms for the first time? Even if you do not remember, I'm sure it was honesty. The unconditional love, hope, protection, enthusiasm, devotion, and lastly, honesty, that connects these things and makes them real and valid. It is well known that our first memories define us. Then why aren't we honest? Why do we have to lie to the people that surround us and why do we lie to ourselves? We ignore the homeless who needs help, but after going home we post on Facebook a quote about the importance of empathy. We have no patience to listen to our brother or sister talking about their latest experience with an ugly spider in the kindergarten, but we post images of us and write, hashtag I love them. We dress up decently every Sunday, go to church, gently smile to everyone, then go home and criticize everything we just heard and said. <coughs> we want everybody to treat us as good people. And yes, I'm not using a word like successful, interesting or splendid, but good, because it is enough. In its simplicity and clarity, it represents the set of positive things in life. Because if we zoom out, we can see that there are only two ways, the good and the bad one. And if you are willing to choose the first one, you have to do it completely. You cannot be an actor in your own life, a good man or woman just on the surface, because there will always be an inner voice that says, you're a liar. 
you seem good, you seem happy, you seem decent, but you're not. I heard a story. In a village, some men were working with stagged line. The process is really dangerous, so they didn't let children come close. Yet two boys went too close to the pitfall. The gases got on their eyes. They began to run home while squalling and crying. The father of the first kid took his boy immediately to the hospital. The second one wanted to do the same, but his wife stopped him. What would the doctor think if the boy appeared in front of him without being cleaned and dressed up well? So she watched her little crying boy while the acid was working, dressed him up well and even combed his hair. The first kid recovered, but for a second when it was too late, he lost his sight. We are combing our hair, trying to seem as if everything <coughs> were okay, and do not want to make a change and do not realize that while doing that we lose our sight. We cannot see the treasures because we are too busy trying to fit some limits the media and the society determine. But we have time, and for now we have sight. Because this is integrity. Seeing the truth and showing the truth. But what is the truth? Please close your eyes, please. See what we often see. We all have our bad hours, bad days, bad months, when we feel lonely and non-valuable. And we cleverly explain to ourselves that it is okay to stay in the darkness. This is the reality. The butterfly you were chasing as a child is gone. Open your eyes. Yes, light again. We do have our happy hours, happy days, happy months. However, we easily forget them when an obstacle occurs. But did you know that when your eyes are closed, you see light? Your brain is searching for light and some stimulating effects on your nerves produce light. Let me tell you something. In these lights, we see our souls. We were created this way and this is not a cute lie, but both the biological truth and the sign from up there that butterfly is still there, waiting for you to catch it. All you need to do is stand up and go there. The reasons for happiness are everywhere. <coughs> in you, in me, in a simple smile. It requires just a resolution, a resolution that leads to understanding that every rule can come from the inside, and your positive integrity is the greatest rule. Questions, please. The problem is that we do not ever know what we have to do, and we have to admit it. So we may choose a solution, and probably we will do some harms, but uh, our intention is good. And uh, this is the most impo important mm -hmm. thing, to be well-intentioned. So, and hope that they may recover from their problems and uh, get better in society, if I can say so. Okay. Thank you very much. What is happiness when compared to truth? Could you repeat, please? What is happiness when compared to truth? Thank you for the question. Well, it is really hard because uh, for everybody, uh, happiness has uh, different faces. In my opinion, happiness is uh, equal to acceptance and gratefulness. So you can accept your situation and be grateful for that. And this doesn't mean that you won't go further, but you know that you, are, you have a place in the world and you are on your way. So you have to accept the truth and go further. The good, the bad and the ugly. In his greatness, a wise man from Texas once said, and I quote, 
Now, there are two kinds of world spurs in this world, my friend. Those that come in house by the door, and those that come in house by the window. And that was all he had to say. And then he loaded his gun and rode off his horse into the sunset. The good, the bad, and the ugly, everyone. Welcome to the Wild West. Question, does this quote that I have just cited have anything to do with integrity? Well, on one hand, absolutely not. But on the other, yes. Because it introduces you to my theory. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, today I proclaim myself a theorist. But not like those philosophers on Facebook who post pictures with hidden messages that sound like this. Life is deceitful and friends are fake. Oh, tell me about it. <coughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to talk about something that sprung to mind immediately after watching this movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Now, what really draws one's attention is the fact that even though our main characters strive for the same purpose, name it money, well, they all have clearly distinct ways of attaining it. What apparently looks like a stereotypical treasure hunt is in fact a display of real life philosophies, three distinct behaviors, and getting to the main topic of the day, three types of intentions. How comes that, you may ask? Well, this stems from a very simple life fact. Not all people have integrity. And if so, are we really sure that integrity in almost any circumstances can be associated with goodness and kindness? Think about it. What if there is more to this integrity concept? What if inside ourselves reside the good, the bad, and the ugly? So, I think we are all familiar with the good type of integrity concept. It's a quality that every man worth his salt aspires to. It encompasses one of the most valuable and beautiful traits in a human being, like loyalty, honesty, uprightness, trustworthiness, and the courage to keep one's word or one's promise, regardless of the consequences. But, because there is always a but, what if I told you that the bad guy possesses most of these characteristics too. <clears throat> there is this scene, and I promise you, that's the only spoiler I'm gonna get you, that goes like this. Our bad guy gets paid by a certain rich man to find the peasant, extract the name from him, and afterwards kill him. Well, he reaches his destination. He meets the poor pal. But the peasant, seeing how the situation develops, tries to buy back the assassin so that maybe he will kill his employer back. What does Angel's eyes do? Well, he kills the peasant, but he takes the money, he goes back, and he kills his employer too. What did he do? He honored his deal towards both of these men, be them dead or alive, keeping nothing in return but only his share of money. Well, as evil and as malicious as it might seem, I personally find it fascinating for a man of such cruelty to still attain his goals in such manners and still have a bit of integrity. And finally, we move to the ugly one too. He sometimes does good, sometimes does bad. You know, some people are better than others, but this doesn't necessarily make them purely good or purely bad. It's just that when someone tries to defend their integrity in front of me, I know for sure that they are really integrated. And, you know, when people aren't integrated, they are dangerous. Not evil, not bad, just I don't really like to ride behind their backs. We have to admit that we have blind spots. If you don't admit you have blind spots, you'll never check these types of people. And if you don't check them, well, you're more likely to get in a wreck. And if you don't believe me, ask the good guy from the movie and you'll surely know what I'm talking <coughs> about. But people, we have great news today. These are just extremes, or maybe rare cases. No one is gonna kill you out of integrity. Probably. Still, I like to believe that we are all mixtures. A little bit of this, a bit of that. Now, that's what variety is all about. I think, and I like to believe, that our reflection of integrity stands upon a power. The power of take, taking decisions which comes from the ability to choose whether at some points or certain moments in your life you want to be the good, the bad, or the other. Thank you.
Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on your speech. And can we really choose if we're the good, the bad, or the ugly? Or are we born with a certain kind of integrity? Thank you. Um, I remember the original heat uh, receiving such a question if we are born with a certain type of integrity. And I remember answering that it is not really that possible. Um, throughout our lives, we develop in such a way in which at some points we will be able to choose carefully what kind of type we want to be. Of course, uh, there will be certain situations in which it uh, or constrained by certain events we will be obliged to do against our will. But yes, we do have a choice. We always have a choice. And as long as you think you are right, then you can choose whatever the world you want to be. The good, the bad, or the ugly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should um, institutions have this sort of flexibility when talking about their integrity? OK. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe you are referring to public institutions or private institutions. OK. Um, well, in terms of public institutions, uh, you know, people working inside those types of institutions should uh, some should get along and uh, be or obey to the public needs. So I believe that even though they think they are right with something, uh, the public or the ones who are in need, the citizens, must be put, must be put in the first place, and. Yes, they should be, uh, people should be in the first place. Lungulescu, Ariadna, I hope, I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, the portrait of Don Corleone as a creator. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start my speech really and explain what I believe integrity is and how its rules apply, let me start by giving you one simple idea. If humans are the only creatures that can possess the um, ability of being righteous, then I believe that integrity is part of what makes the, distinctions, the distinction between humans and every other creature on earth. Now, to talk about integrity, let me give you one very simple example. Somebody comes up to you on the street, be it, be it your mother or your friend or whoever, and provided that person indeed has a disastrous hair day, they ask you, does my hair look all right? Any single one of you and me included would choose to invent a white line and say, it looks interesting. However, this is not what Mussol would do. Mussol being the main character of The Stranger by, by Albert Camus. What Albert Camus tries to do when um, creating this character is he tries to create a prototype of an honest man. Merson never lies, not, not to himself, nor to the people around him. And that makes him lose part of his humanity. He is void of any kind of feeling. He doesn't feel any sadness when his mother dies, or any attack, any attachment towards Marie, his girlfriend. So then, I have contradict contradicted myself in a way. Once, I have said that integrity is part of one what makes us human, and on the other hand, I have also said that honesty, which is interconnected with integrity, makes us lose part of, his, of our humanity if taken too far. Well, I believe what the problem here is, is whether or not we take integrity too far and we respect its rules too much, in a way. About rules, really, let me give you a less conventional example. That of Don Corleone from The Godfather. You may tell me, and rightfully so, that Don Corleone didn't respect any rules. That is true. He didn't respect many of our rules. However, he never really lied either. He didn't take it as far as my sword did. But there's that famous lie. I will make him an offer he can't refuse. A wise lie, but still, the truth. Don Corleone, at some point in the first Godfather movie, is confronted with a very hard decision. His son, his son Santino is killed by one of the other mafia family. So what does Don Corleone do? 
He doesn't try to avenge his son. He knows that shedding even more blood would not bring Santino back to life. So what he does is he gathers the heads of the other mafia families and he asks for a ceasefire. He actually tells his son, his, one of his other sons, Michael, that, and I quote here, all my life I have tried not to be careless. So from this example, we could say that integrity actually is very subjective. And different societies in the world have different ideas about integrity. In Don Corleone's world, not respecting moral rules would lead to you being killed <coughs> most often. In our world, we couldn't really do that. <coughs> so before drawing my conclusions, allow me the privilege of one last example or exercise. If I turned my back to you right now and told you that I would keep my eyes open, from where you are sitting, could you check if my eyes are open or not? Not really. So then, I guess you can't really check if a person has integrity and is righteous or not. And even if you could check if I have my eyes open, what would be my punishment for keeping my eyes closed, perhaps? Could you pull out a gun and shoot me the way they would do in Don Corleone's world? Not really. So to conclude, taking integrity too far makes you lose part of your humanity. And on the other hand, you can't give rules to integrity because they would be subjective. Not all societies in the world could follow the same rules. So to conclude, I believe that integrity indeed has no need of rules. Thank you. Yes, please. Do you think that we can consider Don Corleone a, ro a role model? In a way, every role model is different and every person is different. We are not white or black, all of us. We are shades of grey. So we, you could actually learn some things from Don Corleone. For instance, how to, be, um, how to be honest and how not to be careless, obviously. However, there are some things that you should not learn from Don Corleone, such as killing people, to be blunt. Yes, please. Uh, you talked about how um, losing one's integrity um, means that um, you will lose your life in the mafia world. Do you think legalizing the death penalty turns the state into a big mafia family? That is a very, very controversial um, subject, and I would have to talk for hours to <coughs> fully answer that question. But long story short, not really, because the mafia doesn't have rules that are written down. The world, for instance, the US in the 20s, I don't believe was just a huge mafia state. However, I don't believe in the death penalty either. The example that I gave, I gave that example solely for the purpose of illustrating very harshly you know, um, what would happen if we lived that way, if we gave very strict punishments, not death, but very strict punishments, to things that are moral after all, and that you can't really um, impose laws per se on. Andres Kumara, defining the word integrity. Now, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. This is the definition that you will find when you look up the word integrity in the dictionary. Now, even though it has a very clear definition, a lot of people don't understand what integrity actually means. You know, the deep meaning of it, the one that you have to fill on your own skin in order to be capable of understanding it. Uh, I know that you're all probably thinking, what does this girl have to tell us? And you're all going to be like, yes, you have no idea how many times we've heard this in our lives, we got it. But with that risk of becoming that annoying person that repeats something over and over again, but makes people understand and make better choices and choose that right path, well, I'm going to say what I have to. Ever since the day we were born, we've been taught that we have to be good people, that we have to be honest, and there are some rules that we should follow in order to integrate ourselves in society. 
Because, you know, a person of integrity has lots of qualities that tend to blend together in order to produce a human being who is superior in intelligence and judgment. Not long ago, I found a quote that said something like, integrity is choosing your thoughts and actions based on values rather than personal gain. It's too bad that many people don't understand what this quote is actually explaining. And I'm going to give you a short example. What if I tell you that for a week, no, let's say for a day, there will not be any kind of rules. No rules equals no consequences. And no consequences equals no punishment. That you could do whatever you want, say whatever you want to whomever you want, and go wherever you want. What would you do? Now, I don't know about you in particular, obviously, but what I do know is that a massive amount of people would go through a rebellious phase, destroying whatever comes in their way, and just do what they couldn't do before because of the rules. They would just do whatever they can to make themselves happy without caring what others might be going through for this to happen. But how would they feel afterwards? I mean, would they be happy with themselves? Because I personally won't be able to sleep at night knowing that someone is hurt because of my actions. And that's the thing. We should not be decent people because we're afraid of the rules and of the consequences of these rules. We should be decent people because we're afraid of that punishment that we will give to ourselves. You've probably heard this before, but we are the generation that should make a change, and that's the truth. It may sound like a cliche, but in order to change this world that we live in, we should first change who we are. It is said that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And once something is set in motion, it can't help but build momentum. Therefore, learn how to be a model for those around you and a person worth following. A change is impossible if it doesn't come from within. So learning what integrity is should be a first step that will then mirror in our behavior. What we must all understand is that integrity should be more like a sixth sense, something that comes naturally rather than a thing that you have to think about over and over again in order to remember and understand it. As natural and simple as it is for us to breathe, for example, as natural and normal should be the thought of being a good person. Prove that you don't need rules in order to know how to act. And when in difficult situations, be an example for those around you that might need your guidance and show them that that right path may also be the easy one. Truth is, we are all disciples in this huge world that we live in and we all have so much to learn. And we will never stop our journey of gaining information. There might be life, uh, there might be times when life challenges us and makes us feel like going less, but whenever that happens, remember that there's a road on your right side that's waiting for you. Become whatever you want to become, a teacher, a doctor, a designer, and so on. But bear in mind that you have one more job and that there might be people that look up to you and follow you and that you have a power in your hands that should never be wasted. Be the role model of that child that asks you if it is okay to tell a white lie <coughs> time to time in order to achieve what you want. Tell him that it is not, and that in this way, he'll probably end up in a waterfall of lies in which he'll eventually drown. And one more thing, when lost in a maze, remember that you can find your way out only by listening to your senses that will tell you to always turn right now, integrity, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, or just another sense that will guide you without even noticing. <coughs> now you choose how you want to define it. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, you said become what you want to become. What if I want to become a terrorist so that the Muslim extremists follow me and the, their children look up to me? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, when I said become whatever you want to become, I was talking about accomplishing goals and uh, following a path that's right, not only for you, but for the ones around you. I mean, you have to do what's good uh, as long as you don't hurt others. I mean, for, my for some people, for terrorists, for example, uh, they think that to kill others is good. But uh, we should uh, take into consideration that we, uh, we're responsible for the lives of the ones around us also. So we should uh, think about this before making any decision. Thank you.
We have two questions, so we'll take it in turn, please. Uh, you said that if there were no rules, some people would um, follow their personal games in order to be happy. But do you really think that there are people who think that they can be happy if they isolate themselves from society? And if yes, what should we do and what should they do? Um, thank you. Um, so your question is, if I think that there might be people that will be happy by isolating them, themselves from society, well, there, I don't know, I can't put myself in one of those people's shoes because I don't know how it is to isolate yourself from society. But I think that everyone chooses how uh, they want to live their lives. So if uh, this is what they make, what makes them happy, but without hurting the ones around, they should do whatever they want to do. So that's what I think. Plasoyanu Raris Lucian, the rest of the people, R E S T, rules entitled to support thoughts. Hello, honorable audience. My name is Jarish Ploshoyanu, and the title of my speech is The Rules Entitled to Support the Thoughts of the People. In not so many words, the rest of the people. Today, I am going to share with you my point of view towards the following topic. Integrity has no need of rules. Or at least that's what Albert Camus said. In fact, integrity has no need of rules because it already has its own. At the end of the, of the day, that's what integrity is, a moral code, an inner guideline that an upright person will follow unconsciously. So far, so good, but unfortunately, we are not born with integrity, and we can neither buy it nor install it. And we certainly can't get it in a couple of weeks like a delivered object. So I'm so sorry, this will only take one minute. Hello, yes? Yes, I'm the one that ordered five pounds of integrity last week, and I especially mentioned that I wanted a double portion of honesty. One more minute, sorry. Yes, of course it's a problem. It's not working. I'm still lying to my teacher about me doing my homework in the future. I'll call it back. See? You get no integrity just by talking about it. You have to develop it. And only then can a natural form of integrity be achieved. But how do we do that? Well, it's that simple. We start our learning adventure from the early ages, but when we are children, it's more or less not our duty to discover the right way of thinking. It's our parents, or the persons that take care of us. If they do a good job teaching their children to put value into moral qualities, then half of the process is complete. And what's left for the kid as he or she is growing up is to analyze different behaviors and learn from mistakes in order to hone his or her integrity. In an ideal world, Albert Camus have been right. Integrity should have no need of rules. Unfortunately, our society is far from being perfect. And for those that don't understand the importance of acting morally, I consider there should be a law that would act as a punishment when integrity is not respected. Fine pain, community service, or even conviction for those that persist in their ignorance. But not in prisons, no, 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 no. But in special design schools, that work based on the same system ordinary schools have. This means they have classes, homework, and also exams. The only difference would be that only one subject would be taught in these schools, and this is, of course, advanced ethics or social behavior. To make things clear, I am not stating that Alberta Muse quote is false, but neither is it right nowadays. Those who still believe it is have to wake up and take a look around. And now I'm asking you, how many of you <coughs> had to pay in order to be treated decently by a doctor? How many of you have witnessed policemen letting people go without penalty because they're bribed? And finally, how many of you know politicians that boast about the changes they bring, but after being elected, they forget everything? That's not integrity, folks. An action has to be taken immediately in order to at least reduce, if not completely eliminate the number of those, that, of those that forget the importance of having an honest character. Let's switch from passive to active 
because we are able to make a change. Of course, some will argue that the society brought into this situation in which you think only about yourself and you make things better for you regardless of integrity. I'm sorry to say this, but that's only an excuse. Because the small parts build up and represent a whole. So if a community is not working right, this means there's a problem with its citizens or with some of them. Because it's enough to be a group of people behaving differently in order to break the balance. So before we reach group integrity, we have to focus on the individual one. I'm not sure whether my plan with the enforced law supporting integrity would be adopted soon. But I know one thing for sure. We can go impose our unwritten rules because word of mouth is very powerful. Let's set an example for the rest of the people and then our goal can be reached. Albert Camus visualized a perfect world in which integrity has no need of rules. For the moment, I only hope for a better one. And if you do the same, and you, and you, and if you all do the same, when you leave this room, you'll make it happen. Because it takes only one person to give a spark that will eventually light the fire of change. Thank you for your attention. You've been a great audience. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker, you talked about the school in which ethics are being taught. How, how would you imagine a teacher in that school? What do you need to become such a teacher? Well, uh, first of all, I think it would be a gathering of people that are considered to be upright and honest, and then they would represent the jury. And after that, they can decide whether a person or, or whether a person or somebody is suitable to become a teacher or not in this school of integrity, I'm imagining. At least that's the first plan. I'll be thinking it over. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. David? Okay. Thank you. So you said integrity is an inner guy. And uh, should this be flexible? If yes, how flexible? Well, integrity means uh, respecting your own moral principles. But if someone's life depends on your breaking your moral principles, I think it would be better for you to review your principles. So to this extent, it should be flexible enough. Is it all right? Are you yes. satisfied with my answer? All right, thank you. Yes, I do. Uh, you have an example of your student <coughs> talking to your friends, and you said, um, I still told my English yes. teacher, yeah. Um, that's part of what makes us lose our integrity, not telling the truth. So how do you ensure that the people that you choose as teachers, or the person that, um, that person that you talked about that can ignite this thing in their communities, aren't liars as well? Because I'm not the only or that I'm not the only person who would choose such a person. As I said when I answered my first question, I'd make a gathering. And I choose not only myself, I'm talking about the mass of people. I need you guys. I can't decide on my own. So I need everybody to understand how I feel, you know, and then decide which are the ones that are worth following. And uh, he or she doesn't need to be a liar. He or she has to put the problem in a way that makes people think, in order to make them understand, I'm doing the wrong thing. How should I change? So, um, if I were, not I, I'm, I'm obsessed to die. If somebody has to choose another person to teach them the moral principles, he or she would better ask for somebody else's opinion as well. <coughs> right, thank you. Sprunciano Sebastian, a thing called standards. <laughs> Ever since humanity, along with civilization, started to catch shape, it seems like people have always been aware of the importance of devising a set of moral values and virtues. 
is fine. This, people have to go both through the worst and the best in order to find out what a person should be like on an ethical level. And so, even though some things that were once considered to be taboo gradually became mainstream and vice versa, those that can be used as an indicator of an individual's level of education, consciousness, wisdom and personality never changed. These things, along with many other qualities, only make a small part of what integrity is all about. The rest is just standards. Why, you might ask? Well, that I'm going to tell you in just a few moments. I'd like to begin by asking you a simple, but from what I think, a pretty interesting question. How is it that we've got rules and laws which apply to almost anything regarding our own society, but things like common sense, morality, and why not integrity? Now, I guess it would be pretty odd and frustrating to have such things. But guess what? Someone invented those as well. Let's take, for example, some of the communities which focus a lot on things like honor and having recourse to even putting themselves at risk in case of dishonoring their families. Or maybe some countries where punctuality is taken a lot more seriously than in the rest of the world. Or even some regions where uh, the, leg the legislation, mostly based on religious aspects, doesn't take that much into account gender equality. As you may have already realized, the thing about such societies, and societies in general, is that they've all got their own definition of integrity and of what it takes to be a righteous citizen. Now, here's the crazy part. The same way we think of these standards as being sometimes out of context and even controversial, so do those people consider our attitude towards some things as being inappropriate? Now, you might be wondering, what would the solution to all of these be? Hmm? I think that what humanity needs the most right now is that little glimpse of motivation in order to make them want to be more open-minded and to expand their horizons as well as their tolerance. The thing I believe we all thought about is the idea of integrity having its own list of rules. And at this occasion, I'd like to emphasize the obvious yet mostly unseen paradox of this whole situation. Whether integrity has any of rules or not, one thing is certain. Integrity itself is a list of rules each and every person should respect with the purpose of being accepted as a respectable member of a community. The only difference is that these rules have never been officially registered, for they are and have always been part of what really makes us human beings. This being said, I consider that we should all take a look at what can be really found in anyone's set of moral values and use it as a way of bringing people together. Of course, that doesn't mean we've got to let go of our identity and culture in order to acknowledge our true being. No, it's all about being aware of the importance of the diversity and the unity of the humankind, both separately and combined. To conclude my opinion, I'm going to introduce you to a very short yet very wise saying that I'm pretty sure some of you might have heard of. And that would be, knowledge is power. By saying this, I mean that by knowing at least a bit of every community's culture and values, we can all achieve that power. That kind of power that would help us make great progress towards collective evolution. That kind of power that would establish peace all across the globe. And why not that kind of power that would make out of standards just a thing we once used to believe in? Thank you. Questions, please? <clears throat> yeah. What is your take on the Orwellian principle, ignorance is threat. <coughs> Could you 
should you be, should you be pleased? Uh, ignorance is strength. What is your take on this uh, uh, statement? Well, um, if we think about ignorance as a, a tool uh, for uh, using it against people and uh, doing what's best for us, I think um, it only is something that people perceive and we perceive because it doesn't really exist after all. I mean, um, ignorance is something we show to the people around us in uh, order to make them uh, think that uh, we don't care about a thing or another. But uh, in reality, we are all one and the same. And uh, we, in the end, we will uh, end up uh, being empathetic one with each other, whether we realize it or not at the moment. So ignorance um, may not always be strength, uh, or as well, at least uh, that's what, how uh, it all appears. But uh, it's more of a weakness, if you think. Thank you. Thank you. Please. My question is, what is your opinion about uh, small communities, uh, let's say tribes, where there are no written rules, um, do you think that the tribesmen uh, cannot have integrity? Of course they do. Um, they mm, Just imagine that uh, these <coughs> tribes have been coexisting with uh, the rest of the people for, if not hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And uh, there have been so many generations uh, um, being born and dying uh, within these uh, communities. And uh, it's, uh, obvious, it's obvious that um, in the, even in these uh, little societies, there have been some, um, some let's, say, let's say, not uh, um, rules, but uh, at, at least a trace of... Um, of respect and discipline, you know. Um, if we want exa an example, there's a, a tribe in uh, the Amazon, uh, Amazonian forest, uh, which is said that uh, the people of that tribe only sleep for maximum three hours per night, and that is considered a must for each uh, member of the tribe. Thank you. You mentioned something about peace all around the world. Yes. Do you think you will reach that day? Um, you know, uh, nowadays it seems like um, such a beautiful wish that we, we wish we could all accomplish. And um, to be honest with you, uh, with uh, the circumstances nowadays, uh, it's quite unlikely that it will happen very soon. But um, I really have a feeling that uh, Humanity has come so far and uh, will go so far, uh, will continue going so far in order to um, um, acknowledge uh, the importance of, uh, of global peace and uh, of how good it is to uh, share this whole world, if not the whole universe, and not divide it into specific territories. Our tough speaker is Suchi Tudor with Transcend. Ladies and gentlemen of this exalted assembly, on our whole panel, I would like to begin my speech with the following anecdote. Shortly after World War II, when <coughs> news got around about the Holocaust and people started realizing just how many had died, the following question arose in the general public. Just how was it that so many subordinates of the Nazi regime carried out their orders and not a single one of them questioned the morality of what they were doing? In order to answer this question, a psychologist from Harvard University by the name of Stanley Milgram designed what is now known as the Milgram experiment. Allow me to explain. So, let's say I were to take part, I was the subject of the experiment, only that I would not be told so. I would be told that he over there is the subject of the experiment, and I would be shown a man tied to a bed with wiring all over his body, while on my other hand would be a scientist in a lab coat with a clipboard taking notes following the experiment. What I would have to do is test this new interrogation technique using electric shocks. 
Basically, I would ask the men questions, and every single time he gave me a wrong answer, not only would I shock him, I would also have to increase the voltage. So, the experiment carries on for a while, and at a certain point in front of me would be a screen, and the message, warning, the voltage is getting dangerously high, the subject is in danger of dying, and at that point the man on the bed would be screaming, please, I have a heart condition, this must stop. On my other hand would be the scientist, who says, I take full responsibility of whatever happens next. You may now proceed with the experiment. This is where it gets interesting. This is where we get the actual result of the experiment. Remember, I was the actual subject. And it turns out that 90% of the subjects of the Milgram experiment proceeded to administer the lethal dosage of electricity. They proceeded to ignore their inner sense of morality, and they listened to the authority in the lab coat. They killed that man simply because they were not going to be responsible for it. And perhaps that might give an interesting perspective on the people around you. However, there of course were the other 10%. John Garrett used to call them the uprisers, those individuals who, perhaps for a sense of empathy or whatever moral principle, decided that they should spare the man, that they should not kill him, that it is simply wrong to answer to the authority in the lab coat, to the scientists, and that they should stand up and oppose him, saying, this is wrong, I must stop. And what I find particularly admirable about these individuals is that they achieve what I like to call integrity through transcendence. Allow me to explain. You see, the society that is being built around us is one that is filled with figures of authority that impose rules upon us, that give us orders, and that we tend to naturally follow them simply due to inertia, simply because we're used to it, right? We grow up with it, we see it in our family environments, we see it in school, so it just becomes natural for us. And of course, I'm not to argue that rules are universally bad, they are a good principle, but just like any other good things in life, excess tends to damage us. When we build an illusion, when we create this paradigm in which we follow things mechanically, in which we listen to shepherds guiding us, that's where we find the problem. Because as Charlie Chaplin once said 75 years ago, and what still stands true today, is that we are not machines, we are not cattle, we are men, and we have the love of humanity in our hearts. Of course, it's not easy for one to see through the illusions built around us, but it definitely does pay off. Because it is the only true way that an individual can hope to achieve free will, and therefore to hope to achieve integrity. Because integrity can be defined by acting not only for the good of people, but also acting out of your own free will, not because you were told to do so, right? And the only way in which you can act from your own free will is when that sees past the illusions, when that is not controlled by the paradigm built around you by figures of authority. So ladies and gentlemen, if I want you to take one thing from my speech, if I want you to remember one thing, is that yes, you need to look at your situation as it is right now. You need to look at the constructs around you and you must transcend them in order to build yourself a new vision, a vision that you can use to bring change to your society, both at an individual level and for the people around you. And for all these reasons, I ask you to question everything and to transcend everything you've been taught. Thank you. What if this uh, transcendence um, requires violence? Thank you for your question. I find it rather hard to see a scenario in which this transcendence requires violence purely because I find it more of an internal process, right? It's a transcendence of your own vision. But if you are talking about transcending the constructs around you, yes, they may require violence. However, it turns out that violence in our past, rising up against the regime, has hurt certain people, yes, but has spared others of much more hurt. Right? When you topple regimes that are oppressive 
Yes, that is done with bloodshed, but the future generations that will benefit from that make it definitely worth it. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, the Melbourne experiment seems very interesting. However, um, I think it might be a bit not to the point, as the way I see things, um, the people that followed Hitler, many of them might have followed him for fear of their own lives thinking that if they don't follow orders, they might be killed. What do you think about that? I find your, um, your point somewhat true. However, what we need to keep in mind is that yes, up to a certain point, authority enforces itself with the threat of punishment. But when you build enough inertia, when people are used, in, uh, used to it enough, you no longer need it. Those people were not held to gunpoint constantly. They just knew that there was a regime that could oppress them. Let me give you an example to, to illustrate what I mean. When you cage an elephant, it's gonna try to break its chain, right? So you're gonna have to beat it every single time it, it, it tries to do that. At a certain point, the elephant is gonna stop trying. It could very well break its chain because you're no longer there with a whip to beat it. But it's not gonna try to do so because it already knows that authority exists to stop him. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, it is possible. It is extremely tough for one to do so, but it is possible. I find that a prerequisite for doing that, however, is finding individuals who share your goals. Right? No revolution was started with a single individual. You have, you, you must find individuals who can fight alongside with you. And once you garner enough support for your cause, once you build enough of an enough of a uh, <clears throat> of a base for your revolution, I do believe that it is, it is more than possible. It is probable to happen. Uh, we had a title uh, about cliches. No, it's not a cliche when I'm telling you that I am breathtaking. I am breathless. You were fantastic, and I urge everyone to continue the debates and continue uh, interacting while the jury deliberates. See you in about thirty minutes. last year know that there is uh, an additional award that we give out in the, the finals which is the James Smolder Award for creative and fluent public speaking and this year the award for fluent and creative public speaking which consists of 1000 lei goes to Laurentiu Lupoi. <laughs> Um, well, I think the first thing is to say thank you to everyone, uh, those of you in particular who spoke today. Um, we heard ten incredible speeches, and I've had the pleasure to attend the final for the last three or four years, so I've had some sense of longevity in terms of comparing and seeing how they vary from year to year. Last year there were lots of females in the final, and the female standard of speeches was very high. This year it seems to have swung around, and I did actually throw out the challenge last year and said I'd like to see a few more boys in the final next year. Um, and it seems that you've risen to the challenge, and this year we, it seems like we had um, many more boys than um, girls competing. So well done for you to making the final. Um, also a big thank you to Shane Egan from the British Council. Um, a pleasure to be judging with you. Also a big thank you to um, Maria Bojan from the Ministry of Education. Um, when we're, in the last three or four years when I've been in the room deliberating, um, there's always been some point of contention. We're not, you know, 
you feel strongly about this particular speaker, someone feels strongly about this particular speaker, speaker, and you have to really sort of negotiate and debate your way through to the final selection. This year it wasn't like that. We sort of went down the list, we all chose who we felt stood out for their own particular reason, and without a doubt there were three that stood out um, for, but for Maria, for Shane, and myself. Um, and that's unusual. So we didn't really have to um, debate uh, out of the ten who the first, second, and third place were. We knew who first, second, and third place were, were automatically. And hopefully when um, Ella announces who first, second, and third are, it'll make some sense to you as well. Because for us to have three judges all unanimously, we did it, we did it anonymously, in fact. We circled out th the three that we liked, then we read out the names, and they were just all, all three came through straight away. So we didn't have to negotiate. Then we went through the, the long deliberation of, okay, so who do we choose this year? They're all great in their own way. And I think this year we saw something that, um, for me, was, it was really interesting because the, th the, the first three speakers were all unique in completely different ways. They are all wonderful examples of how to give a great speech. So if, I had, if we broke them into three categories, the first one was your... Um, your stereotypical, doing everything you would expect in a speech, speech, um, crossing all the boxes, ticking all the boxes, uh, had the crowd laughing, had the crowd listening attentively, um, great structure, a little tingle up your spine, everything you look for in a great speech. So that person had really studied speech writing and understood inherently what a great speech is and then practiced it until that person knew it off by heart and really delivered it flawlessly. Uh, impressed us all. Uh, the second speaker, that speaker won us over through charisma. So that's your typical Stephen. So the first one is maybe someone like David Cameron who just knows how to give a good speech, does it, and he, he's able to give a good speech because he went through the, the Cambridge Oxbridge circle and has become a confident public speaker. And, and as a result, they, you know, they bring them into the diplomatic core or into politics. The second speaker was your Tom Robbins, that person who can stand up, animated, full of life, win the crowd over because they're a crowd pleaser. And people just like that sort of person, the way that they speak. And they will, they're that sort of person who will walk into the room and people will just notice the energy across the room and think that that person has something special. And so for us, this person also had something special. And this person stood out very, very clearly to us. And the third was just that person who's a little bit different, a little bit quirky, and there's something about them which is a little bit different, and you can't always put your finger on it, but you like that difference. It's something that stands out in the, all three of these people. What is a great speech? A great speech is one that you'll remember next week, or the week after, or even next year. And so these three speak, speakers, I would definitely remember what they said in a week or two weeks from now. And I think one of them in particular I will definitely be rem remembering for the year ahead. And that, in the end, was the person that we all decided was first place. Um, I think the only feedback I would give you in terms of preparing for next year is, um, I think, look at speeches given by people in real life. Uh, speeches given in the public eye. Okay, a lot of you became focused on you know, turning to the dictionary for a definition. You know, telling the story about how you wrote the speech. That this never happens in real life. So I, I, would, I would encourage you all to move away from that model. Don't mention dictionaries, don't read out definitions and share different definitions of what integrity is and this and I think integrity is this. Give a speech that embodies, embodies the essence of integrity. And whatever that may be, whether it's integrity in a certain model or whether it's integrity in, the, in its essence and a feeling, and in a model I talk about, and in a model, an example in life. So try to move away from dictionary definitions. I think that's the first. And try to move away from, unless it's really important to you, the process of how you wrote the speech. If that process is inherent and, and absolutely integral in the speech itself, then of course you have to explain it because they won't understand the speech unless they understand the, the process of elaboration that you went through to arrive at that final point. But apart from that, I would say try to give a speech that exists on its own, exists in time. And actually, it's not even so much to do with you. You're delivering a topic. You're just the vessel delivering that speech. That speech will become timeless. It may have come from a certain individual, but that speech was its own. It's almost like you're a vessel for God, and you're channeling that message through to the crowd. 
And if you channel it perfectly, you forget who you are. Like an actor on the stage, you're delivering a message. It doesn't really matter that the, the message comes from you, or from you, or from you. The message itself is so pure that it just has to come, and it comes through you. And I think that's truly what a great speech is. And I think today we had a perfectly delivered speech. We had a perfectly charismatic speech. And then we had someone who was delivering a message, and they became the message themselves. And that was the person in the end that we felt was unique enough that we thought they would represent Romania very well. So without further ado, I will pass you back to Alan Nikolai, who will present those three to you. Um, to say thank you to Alan, we can all say thank you to Alan. And for those of you who are back, back again next year, I know two or three of you were here last year and you came back stronger than you were last year. So for those of you who are returning next year, we hope that you've taken a lot away from this and you'll come back stronger than ever. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, not to add up to your uh, nerves and emotions, but we're going to work our way up to the first three. So we'll start with the honorable mentions. And we have honorable mention going to Sebastian Sprinciano. mention goes to Mara Petrescu. Well done. Honorable mention goes to Ariadna Lungulescu. workout from your books and your prizes. Uh, honorable mention goes to Lupoe Laurentiu. <laughs> honorable mention goes to Istvan Jakob. mention goes to Paul Gaika. Honorable mention goes to Florina Adrian Diaconu. goes to Rares Lucian Plesoianu. <laughs> Second place goes to Boton Silagi. goes to Tudok Suchi.
suppose a speech is due. Uh, there is no feeling quite like being awarded the winner of any competition ever. And the interesting thing is that the thrill you feel, those emotions that come before being awarded this prize, stand strong. See, we humans tend to desensitize ourselves to a lot of things, but this feeling in particular, I find, stays quite strong. I want to thank every single person who has helped me in my career as a public speaker. I want to thank my family who has supported me in every aspect besides public speaking and that as well. I want to thank every single person who has held amazing speeches, and not only that, who inspires me and who changes my perception of the world and the people around us every single day. And I truly hope that these ideas will not die. And call me optimistic, but I do believe that we are quite a sample of the portion of the population who is to change things around us. And for all these reasons, I could not be more grateful to every single one who has taken part in organizing this competition and who supports speakers like us. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations to all of you. I think everybody has had a uh, wonderful speech and you've all done very well. Many thanks to our adjudicators for being here today with us and doing an absolutely wonderful job and difficult one. I, for one, know that would not have liked to be in their place having to make these decisions. Uh, I would also like to invite everybody, meaning the participants and our esteemed adjudicators, to have a group photo. And last but not least, so that we don't forget, I'm going to have to ask the 10 of you to sign some papers, so just want you to say that. But otherwise, uh, if I can just ask everybody for a photo. Yeah, yeah. 